Well, friends, we are, we are going to come to the table this morning, which is for us the drama of the gospel. So if you need to be reminded that you are secure in Christ, I'm not sure there's anything I can say that would transcend what this table can communicate to you. So we're going to come to this table in just a little bit. But before that, let me invite you to take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. For several weeks now, we have been opening up God's word and examining what the triune God has to say about his church. We believe the church is his idea consisting of his people, purchased by the blood of his son and indwelt by his spirit. In other words, the idea of the church is not something we have manufactured. It is not the result of man's ingenuity. The church in every way belongs to God, and it exists for his purposes alone. But because God is infinitely kind and eternally gracious, the church is also a tangible gift to his people. Brothers and sisters, in every possible way, we want this church to reflect the teaching of God's word. So this morning, we will, we will be talking about biblical leadership, focusing our attention on the office of elder. Now, you might be tempted to go, Jason, we've been singing about the gospel. We're going to come to the table, and you're going to interrupt that by talking about biblical leadership and elders. And friends, I would encourage you that it's not an interruption This is the outworking of what we've been talking about over the last several weeks. As we seek to preach and embrace the gospel in every area of our lives and in our church life, we need the gospel to shape our leaders. We need that. So I would encourage you, don't disconnect these, but make this important connection. Moving forward, this is one of the most important discussions we will have, especially as we ask God to connect our doctrine and our culture. How are we going to recognize, train, and affirm elders? This is a weighty task, friends. And we are exceedingly grateful that God is sovereign and that he has promised to build his church in spite of the wise or unwise decisions that we make. So let's dig into God's word and let's get a snapshot of what eldership looks like. The task this morning is not to explain every element of our church structure and government. So this is not a a lecture on church polity. But I want to primarily look at one text where we find a real life portrait of what biblical shepherding looks like. Acts chapter 20 The Apostle Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders, and and we see a picture emerge, a a portrait of biblical shepherding. So we'll talk more about specific qualifications for this office at another point. But look with me this morning at this wonderful scene, beginning in verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course And the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. 
for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Oh, friends, what a, a beautiful picture we have here. If I had to sum up Paul's instructions as it relates to elders, I would say that an elder is or should be striving to become or, or growing into a humble servant leader. A humble servant leader. And we see this humility manifest in a number of different ways. In fact, the first clue toward the humility that an elder must possess is found in verse 17. Right out of the gate. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Notice that Paul sent for the elders, plural, of the church, singular. The New Testament design for the church is a plurality of elders. A quick survey of the New Testament presents a clear picture of multiple elders in each church. In fact, no clear example is found of a church organized under a single pastor. The New Testament, almost without exception, refers to elders in the plural. Throughout the book of Acts, elders are always plural. Additionally, Paul instructs Titus to appoint elders in every town. And in his letter, James instructs the sick to call for the elders of the church. So Mark Dever concludes the picture in the New Testament is that there is normally within the local church a body of elders, not simply one elder. Now, this is not news to anybody here. But I would suggest to you that the wisdom of God can be seen in this. His ordaining of multiple men to oversee a local church. This helps assure that decisions are not self-willed or self-serving to a single individual. Right, because decisions are made and the congregation is led through the combined counsel and the wisdom of elders. A biblically qualified pastor must be someone who is willing to work with a team. The leadership of the church is not supposed to be a one-man show. And therefore, the church should not reflect the preferences of one particular person, even if that person is a vocational preaching pastor. Friends, the elders of this church do not exist to carry out my desires for this church. But I exist as one member of the team of elders so that collectively we can humbly and graciously submit to each other under the authority of God's word giving ourselves to constant and persistent and desperate prayer. Friends, that's the only way we will lead this church well. In fact, this is one very important way you can be praying for this church and praying for your elders. Pray that God would allow a, a true plurality to exist. A group of unified and humble men 
all committed to Christ and committed to each other. That we would not only teach you the doctrines of grace, but model for you a culture of grace. Don't assume that's happening. Pray for it. Plead with God to make it so. Ask your elders how they're doing. Not in a nosy or intrusive way, but with obvious concern and Christ-like love. In our text, Paul is addressing a group of men called elders, equal in authority, though undoubtedly different in elements of their gifting. They're working together for the good of those they're shepherding and for the glory of God. Elder teams should never be marked by power struggles where each man is trying to overtake the others, grasping for center stage. But they should be committed to their God-ordained task. Again, under the authority of Christ, accountable to each other, and accountable to the congregation they serve. Now, there, there's an important key in our text that helps us understand how men can serve in this way humble and unified. Look at verse 19. Whose servant is Paul? He is serving the Lord with all humility. That's typically a phrase that we would throw away, that we would skate right on by, but pause there, friends. This is another way of saying what, what, what he says in many other places, including his greeting to the Romans. Paul, a a servant of Christ Jesus. In humility, Paul recognizes and submits to the lordship and leadership of Jesus Christ. Right? This is not his church, as it were. I don't think you'd hear Paul talking that way. Humility and unity will be present in elders when they share the same identity and mission. In fact, look at verse 28. In verse 28, they, they belong to God, purchased by Christ's blood, made overseers by the Holy Spirit, set apart and gifted to care for the flock of God. The identity and vision of biblical elders is rooted in the triune God, right? Fundamentally, an elder is, or ought to be, quite simply, a humble servant of the Lord. Many of the problems church leaders face would be solved if they simply remain grounded in a biblical understanding of whose they are, which is the foundation for who they are. An elder who is willingly submitting to the Bible's authority, allowing it to speak into his life more than his biggest fans do. Who is also willingly submitting to a brotherhood of godly men, including his fellow elders. Friends, these are some of the weapons God has given an elder to keep him from buying into his own hype. Let me give you a very practical example of this. When we gather as elders to meet and pray, for the most part, we address each other in conversation and we refer to each other in prayer as brother. Not only is this a practice modeled in Scripture, but it reminds us. It reminds us that while we aren't employed by the same company and we don't have the same amount of money in our accounts and we possess varied gifts and abilities, and so many aspects of our life are different. Fundamentally, we are brothers in Christ. This is a simple practice that I think encourages humility toward each other and affection for each other. Friends, we need elders who embrace who they really are, and we need congregations that embrace who elders really are. Author Curtis Thomas reminds us of this biblically humbling reality. This is what he writes. Pastors are sinners. Thank you for not amening. <laughs> Pastors are sinners. 
They have weaknesses and faults just like church members. They will continually do battle with their sinful nature. Churches sometimes forget that pastors are sinners. And I would add, sometimes pastors forget they are sinners. And this can lead to unrealistic expectations or the abuse of authority. This is why, brothers and sisters, we have verse 28. Look at verse 28. Paul encourages these elders to pay careful attention to yourselves. Right, so part of the task of eldership is inward. Right? Don't just look out, looking for ways to serve, looking for ways to invest. Take care of yourself. Look at your own heart. Understand your own temptation. Understand the enticement that you face towards sin. Right? Elders are sinners. Even though, even though we've been saved by God's grace, gifted by a spirit, just like everybody else, we're battling sin and temptation squarely in the process of sanctification. If you, if you need proof of that, ask Karen what it's like at our house when it's bath time on a Saturday night. I am not yet fully sanctified. Right? Scripture offers us certain qualifications, and we must take those qualifications very seriously. But those qualifications are evidences of God's transforming grace. They are not reasons to boast in ourselves. Elders must be humble servants of the Lord. In verse 19, Paul openly speaks of his weakness. He served through tears and trials. Paul's model for these elders was one of brokenness and authenticity. For Paul, there is no effort to paint himself as a superhuman robo-elder who is unaffected physically and emotionally by the pressures of life. No, he's a, he's a real guy. That's why I love this text. This is no super apostle. This is someone who got tired and wept and was tempted, and had to work hard. Elders should not be men who appear to have everything together, but open, authentic, and growing Christians. So brothers and sisters, do you have categories for elders who meet biblical qualifications, but are still growing? Without dismissing or taking lightly the qualifications laid out in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, we must guard against a church culture that makes elders feel like they must hide their weakness and their weeping. Again, over the last month, we have transitioned to two elder meetings a month. And one of those meetings is dedicated entirely to the elders caring for each other. It's a time where we pray for each other by name, lifting up specific requests for each other. It's an opportunity for us to be honest and open and vulnerable. With the Spirit's help, we hope to develop a culture of grace and kindness and patience and long-suffering with each other, the same culture we hope the Spirit grants to us all as a church. Notice verses 20 and 21. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So there, there is this cultural aspect in terms of behavior. But we don't want to miss this. As a shepherd of the flock of God, an elder's primary responsibility is that of instruction. Elders are men gifted by God to teach the scriptures. This is their passion. This is the one qualification that sets elders apart from deacons in terms of gifting. Titus 1, 9, speaking of an elder's qualifications, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, I think it's important that 
that I bring this up, that we note this. Nowhere are we told exactly what this looks like, this gifting to teach or explain God's word. We would probably tend to think about it strictly in terms of upfront preaching type of instruction, but I think that would be a jump to limit this qualification of elders to that one very public form of instruction. I love Pastor Michael Lawrence's simple explanation of this qualification. He said of an elder's ability to teach, spending time with him makes the scripture more clear, not less clear. If you've been in a church for very long, you've probably seen this, right? There are those who are very gifted in public speaking. They can open their Bibles and clearly explain a text. And the body is built up by that. And then there are others. If they were put in front of a couple hundred people, they could speak in complete sentences and use real words, but it wouldn't be all that helpful. But meet that same brother for coffee and listen to him share the wisdom of God's word across a breakfast table and you will walk away edified and encouraged and hungry for God's word. Friends, entire congregations should be marked by biblical literacy, but this must be especially true of the elders. In fact, in verses 29 and 30, Paul warns that some from the outside will come into the church and others will rise up from within the church and they will attempt to draw people away from the truth of God's word. That corresponds with Titus 1.9. So, God gifts men as elders for the church's protection to teach you what is right, to point out what is wrong. Help you understand truth and to identify and expose error. So the church that will stand strong when attacked from the inside and the outside is a church where the elders and everybody else take seriously the responsibility to know God's word and clearly and faithfully instruct those under their care. Right? That's, that's the responsibility of everybody to some degree. That should mark our marriages and our families and our community groups and life groups, our children's classes and our youth group. Beyond the elders, friends, and throughout this entire church, there must be a a culture of discipleship where every follower of Christ is helping someone else follow Christ. Whether or not there is a program for it. So as we move forward as a church, please don't think that meaningful ministry within this church, especially discipling relationships, need to be part of an organized or elder-sanctioned ministry program. You don't need to ask for permission to study God's word with each other. Do it. One of my favorite John Piper quotes of all time fits so well here. I hope this is true of Redeemer Bible church. Piper writes, we are people of the book. We know God through the book. We meet Christ in the book. We see the cross in the book. Our faith and love are kindled by the glorious truths of the book. We have tasted the divine majesty of the word and are persuaded that the book is God's inspired and infallible written revelation. Therefore, What the book teaches matters. Doctrine is important for worship and life and mission. But friends, this is someone everybody should be involved. It's something everybody should be involved in. Right? Take the effort. Meet somebody. Go out to coffee with them or or meet in some other situation. Get to know each other. Ask, tell me about how you came to Christ. Hear their story. Listen to it. Pray together. Ask them, would you like to continue to meet and and read through James and just talk about it? 
read through the Gospel of John and just talk through it. Friends, if, if that began to mark our church, it would have an incredible effect. So God gifts certain men with the necessary character and ability to serve as his under-shepherds in the care and leading of his church. He does this for his glory and for the benefit of every church member. We see this from the earliest days of the church as it continues to mature. Paul states in verses 20 and 21 that he did not shrink from declaring what was profitable. Does that sound familiar at all? Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. That is what drove Paul. And that's what must drive every biblical shepherd. They must be unwaveringly committed to the Word of God and teaching and imparting God's Word. The text reiterates it again in verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And notice that Paul was willing to do this in any setting. Back in verse 20, he taught in public and from house to house. There was a certain accessibility, intentionality to Paul's ministry. He desperately wanted people to understand the Holy Scriptures. He was in the trenches. He wasn't off limits except on Sunday. He wasn't set apart, camped out on the mountain, waiting to hear from God so he could take the word down to regular Christians. No, he was with his brothers and sisters. Teaching them, living life in their presence, subject to all the same failures and temptations as they were. Friends, that's the ministry of an elder. A seminary professor I had said it this way, a shepherd must bear the stench of sheep. Right? He's with them. Elders, again, are chosen and gifted by God to serve the church by opening up the Bible and explaining everything inside of it. This book alone is God-breathed. It carries divine authority. It is sufficient for all things required for life and godliness. So elders aren't biblical elders if they don't know and teach God's word. But to combine this with what we've already talked about, elders aren't biblical elders either if they don't know and love God's people. Right? So it's not simply about biblical knowledge. It's about shepherding and care. In fact, back in verse 28, when Paul exhorts these elders to pay careful attention to their own lives, what else does he say? He says, pay careful attention to the flock as well. After the warning I mentioned before about wolves, look at verse 32. I love this. This might be my favorite part of this speech Paul gives. He says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Friends, ultimately, God's people are in his hands. Isn't it good to know that even when elders fall and when elders fail, when they fail to care for you the way they should, God will not abandon you. Even as Paul commends these elders to God's care and to the word of his grace, all believers are held fast by God. The song we sang just a few minutes ago. And it's according to his unfailing love for us in Christ. There's so much more in this wonderful text, but let me draw this to a close by asking you to look at verses 33 through 35. Paul says, I coveted no one's silver or, or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me 
in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul reminds them that he did not swindle them, right? As some philosophers and teachers of the day would have done, but he conducted himself with honesty and integrity. He worked hard for what he needed and he worked hard so that he, would, he could be generous with those in need. What I love about these three verses is that they serve to illustrate the spirit of what everything Paul has challenged these elders with. Right? He has called them to follow his example, to serve Christ and his church humbly as servant leaders. And and though he's most likely talking about possessions, he captures the essence of the whole task of eldership by citing the words of Christ. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Friends, what if those words didn't just describe the service and mindset of elders, but describe the whole culture and atmosphere of this church? Men and women who are so overwhelmed by the grace they have received in Christ, they they are just relentless in looking for avenues of giving grace to others. What if you and I prepared our hearts Saturday evening by asking the Holy Spirit to lead us to someone on Sunday morning who needs encouragement and comfort? Right? That's my agenda. Holy Spirit, lead me. Lead me to someone who needs encouragement and comfort. Help me to give. A church marked by humble, selfless service where people don't come week after week primarily motivated by what they can get, but by what they can give. Here's a great place to start if you're wondering what you can give. Because you you consider yourself as one who has little in the way of, of gifting or material possessions. You can start with this, right? This is available to everybody. You can offer someone a helping hand, a listening ear, a a few moments to pray with someone before you rush out of here. Brothers and sisters, there are a thousand ways we can serve each other if we want to. And if we're looking to. So pray Prepare and then give yourself in the service of Christ and his church. So all that we see in this portrait of an elder, in some sense, we want to be true of the entire church. That this whole body would be marked by humble, selfless service. Let's pray together.